Understanding Creation, the book, and uh, the chapter in particular, When Did Creation Occur? The uh, book, Understanding Creation, is just out this year. Uh, it's been uh, really interesting to see how fast they got in it together. Um, I don't think any of it's over a year old in terms of uh, the uh, beginning of writing. Uh, it's edited by uh, James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. Uh, James Gibson is the uh, director of the Geoscience Research Institute here in Loma Linda, and Umberto Rossi is retired from, uh, well, not really, but uh, uh, officially retired from the uh, General Conference the Dep uh, Department of Education. So uh, uh, they basically they got 20 chapters, which are questions. And they're intended to be standalone, although obviously you can't really do this kind of thing completely on a standalone basis. Um, but, uh, but they're intended so that you don't have to read chapter one first and then chapter two and then chapter three and so forth. Um, and uh, when we were given the assignment, um, we were supposed to use 1,800 to 2,400 words. And I know in my particular case, uh, we started running into 2,500 words. It was really tough to, uh, to keep it down there. And uh, then I discovered when they got through editing it, they expanded it. And the 2,400 words does not count the, uh, the footnotes, which uh, include two pages. In, in my case, a little over two pages. The chapters are as follows. Uh, Rossi addresses the question, um, why do different scientists interpret reality differently? Uh, James Gibson uh, addresses the question, what is creation theory? Um, Dave Ekins, uh, are the Bible and science in conflict? Elaine Kennedy, what is the difference between data and interpretation? Uh, Standish, what is the evidence for a creator, which I think is one of the more important chapters? Uh, Randy Yonker, how can we interpret the first chapters of Genesis, which is, I think, the major one that has to do with the Bible itself. Although, as you'll see, I, I do a little bit of that my, uh, myself. Uh, <coughs> uh, Mark DeGroote, uh, what are the meaning and implications of the Big Bang Theory? And then my chapter comes, chapter 8, uh, when did creation occur? And um, George Avor talks about where did life come from. Um, obviously, whoever wrote that question uh, didn't believe in the rule that uh, you never use a participle to end a sentence. Uh, pardon me, a, a preposition to end a sentence with. Um, How reliable is radiometric dating by uh, uh, Clyde Webster? Ariel Roth's uh, chapter, which will come up in a few weeks here, on Can I Believe in a Worldwide Flood? Uh, Biagi's uh, chapter, What Does the Fossil Record Tell Us? Ben Clausen, How Do Plate uh, Tectonics Relate to the Bible? Uh, Raul Esperanti, How Do Dinosaurs Fit into a Biblical Perspective? Um, uh, Cowles and Gibson, apparently the cooperative one. This is the only one in the book that I noticed. Does the theory of evolution explain the diversity of life? Uh, we'll have to ask Jim Gibson the uh, origin of that one. Leonard Brand, is the theory of evolution scientific? It's an interesting question. Uh, Ronnie Nealon, where do humans come from? So we're going to address anthropology there. Uh, Earl Agard, what are the moral implications of Darwinism, a kind of a philosophical, theological, uh, ethical uh, chapter? Uh, John Ashton, can a Christian be a good scientist, addressing a kind of a practical question? Uh, and then the last chapter uh, by Gary Burdick, uh, how can I live without having all the answers? And uh, it's an interesting uh, 
uh, question, I think an important one, although a lot of people try to ignore that question. Um, I can tell you from my own experience, I, I suppose it depends on your subject, but for when did creation occur, 2,400 words is a very tight limit. So what I tried to do is I cut down the chapter by assuming rather than proving that intelligent design was in fact correct because I, I think that you have to ask, actually ask and answer Tim Standish's question before you get to the time question. And uh, there's a philosophical reason for that. I also tried not to deal at any length with the question of the age of the universe. That can go on for a long time. And um, I'm not sure that it is as pertinent to what we're dealing with. Um, uh, and I tried to simplify the choice to an old creation of two varieties, either an old creation by God or an old creation by the devil. Having already ruled out in principle, and that's why uh, I put it there, there as the first question, um, the idea that an old evolution without any creation whatsoever uh, was a valid uh, point of view. Uh, well, I suppose it depends on what you mean by valid, but what I mean is that it's not one that is reasonably likely. And uh, then I basically looked at the biblical evidence, the theological evidence, and then the scientific evidence. And uh, so get ready for a whirlwind. Put on your seatbelts because we're going to move. Introduction. Some conservative Christians insist that the Earth is only some 6,000 years old. The scientific community insists that vertebrates go back some 500 million years, a little plus, and that the Earth itself goes back some 4.6 billion years. Who, if anyone is right, and does it really matter? In this chapter, we will make some background observations and then consider different models for creation and the biblical, theological, and scientific evidence relevant to those models. We will then consider the implications of our choice of model for when creation took place. So I've tried to s basically give the outline that I gave in a little more detail just a little bit uh, above. Preliminary considerations, and here I'm talking about intelligent design. Not so much the intelligent design movement as the concept that there was an intelligent designer that designed and then made it happen that chance and natural law are just not adequate to the task of creating what we see today. Before we discuss the above question, that is, when did creation occur, we should ask a preliminary question, namely, did creation take place? Now, it's interesting because the, when it first uh, the, the first question that I got was actually, when did creation take place? So uh, the editor didn't, uh, uh, didn't uh, change everything when they went through and changed the uh, title. And so uh, it should say, did creation occur? I'm going to assume that the answer is yes. Nature did not create itself reasons for that answer. And see, so what I'm going to do is basically punt to the other guys and not argue. Can be found in Signature in the Cell by Steve Meyer as well as The Edge of Evolution by Michael Behe and Science Discovers God by Ariel Roth. And for that matter, in The Privileged Planet by Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards. See also the chapter by Timothy Standish in this volume, which uh, we'll hear in more detail on the 19th. See also, uh, pardon me, if we accept the concept that God did indeed create the universe and life and that the results of this creation are detectable, the two things that intelligent design, the intelligent design movement insists on. Notice intelligent design is not anti-evolution necessarily. It just simply says that naturalism 
a thoroughgoing naturalism is not an adequate explanation for what we see. That God not only exists, he not only creates, but you can tell that he creates, that there's good evidence for it. Um, several important consequences follow. Remember, uh, the, the note five, uh, the other ones are just simply re references to the books themselves. Um, intelligent design does not prove the existence of God, but is widely recognized as being religion friendly. And I think that if you add a few kind of reasonable assumptions, it in fact does um, argue strongly for the existence of God. There are some. So what, what be Probably David Berlinski being the most prominent one. So what's their motivation? Uh, their motivation is the, is the science. In fact, nobody in the intelligent design actually comes at it from a religious point of view. When you hear otherwise, that's the enemies of intelligent design deliberately slandering the, the intelligent design advocates. It's a mistake to say that intelligent design is theologically driven. It's scientifically driven. Um, number one, if we accept intelligent design, and as I said, add a few kind of reasonable things, like the universe has a finite age, um, Atheism is not a valid option. Number two, the scientific consensus has obviously goofed here. It cannot be trusted implicitly, and particularly so when there are theological consequences. The consensus has been wrong on intelligent design. If we assume that it has been wrong, um, and it's, it is legitimate to ask if it could be wrong elsewhere. Number three, we have to do what the intelligent design people did and go back to the actual data, not to the scientific consensus, if we want the truth. Number four, the project of explaining all of natural history without regard to the supernatural is invalid. That whole paradigm that says you cannot have any forces besides the ones that we can demonstrate in science is just wrong. Number five, reliable eyewitness accounts become more important in determining history than scientific reasoning. Because you might have had a miracle, and particularly in a theologically charged area. And number six, theological reasoning becomes as important for determining the historical facts as scientific reasoning and it becomes indispensable to have the right theology. Now, that last consideration may be surprising to many, but if we take a moment to think about it, predicting what God would do in a given situation depends more on theology than on science. With this background, we're now ready to consider the question, when did creation take place? Or as it would have been edited if everything had been perfect, when did creation occur? It might, be, it might help to consider several answers. For now, we will not consider creation of the universe or even the solar system. So here I'm passing the buck on those ones because I want to zero in on the really important theological one. The most important theological question here is when did the creation of life take place? Some proposed answers are, and I think they're pretty inclusive of people who are insisting that God had a hand in the process. And we've already gotten, at least we've assumed that we've gotten that far. A, life was a result of front-loading of the universe with very precise initial condi conditions or physically instantiated information so that without any physical laws being broken, life developed about 3.8 billion years ago, after Big Bang 13.7 or whatever number years ago, a uh, billion years ago, 
And, but, but notice that life comes uh, perhaps uh, 10 billion years after the universe got started and continued to develop according to plan. Creation may be thought of as being completed in one sense at the Big Bang or whenever the universe originated, but the results were not seen until a few billion years ago. That's one way of looking at things. B, God specifically intervened at the origin of life some 3.8 billion years ago and then possibly again several times, including at the Cambrian explosion. In between God's intervention, nature followed the usual laws. So God intervenes here and then here and then here in specific ways that he didn't orchestrate this all at the Big Bang, but rather he actually intervened in the middle of things. C, God has continually guided a process of gradually increasing complexity with life starting some 3.8 billion years ago, with overt miracles being rare but covert ones being common. That is, you know, little mutations that when you add them all up, they're not statistically likely, but there's no obvious violation of natural law and the statistical things are done in such a small way that un unless you try to add them up, uh, you'd have a hard time finding when God actually intervened. Evolution really is a guided process, contrary to what is stated in most textbooks. Now, this is a guided evolution. And that is an intelligent design position. And, and by the way, that's anathema to the scientific community. They don't like that any more than they like the other two, two options. D, life started some 3.8 billion years ago, but the intervention that has produced increasingly complex forms came from demonic sources rather than from God. Uh, Jack Provence is probably one of the more prominent, uh, or was, one of the more prominent uh, advocates of this kind of uh, way of looking at things. Um, God then stepped in a few thousand years ago and created Adam and Eve, who then fell, and the rest of the history is reflected in the biblical record. Pardon me? Uh, that's not, most people wouldn't say it's Catholic. Um, uh, Jack Provence is Adventist. There are some evangelical Christians who have looked at things this way. Um, Well, we're going we're gonna to go into that in just a, a little bit. Um, e, the final one, God created all of life in the short period of time described by Genesis. And what we see in the fossil record is the result of a recent flood rather than millions to billions of years claimed in standard geological theory. Now, <clears throat> The question of exactly how many thousands of years ago, again, I'm going to basically punt on that. Uh, not because I couldn't deal with it, but because in 2,400 words, you're not going to get <laughs> enough time to really deal uh, adequately with that kind of stuff. And there isn't that much out there that's really carefully looking at things um, without uh, making some assumptions that uh, many people would not want to make. So, those are the five basic I, uh, uh, positions. Now, the first three are kind of difficult to test against each other. It is difficult to test the differences between theories A, B, and C and their theological consequences are also difficult to distinguish. And so for our purposes, they will be lumped together. We thus have three options, knowing that one of them is a composite option. Old divine creation, God did it, it took a long time. Old demonic creation with a recent divine creation. And recent divine creation solely. We will consider three lines of evidence, biblical, theological, and scientific. Now, the biblical considerations. If one reads the story in Genesis 1, 
it is clear that the story reads like history. For example, it uses a standard narrative form, the while consecutive, and I'm not going to include all the references here. If you want them, they're in the book. And I don't get a cut from the book, by the way. <coughs> With the days being ordinary days consisting of an evening and morning, and, the, and again, the references uh, to Hazel's article in Origins, in, in the era before the rise of modern geology, the story was interpreted, with rare exceptions, as describing six ordinary days. And Sarah from Rose wrote probably the most comprehensive uh, book on uh, uh, early church fathers. Um, the significant Christian exceptions are Origen and Augustine. Origen is a, um, an outlier, let's just say. He was famous for allegorical interpreta interpretations of the Bible, uh, period. Augustine is particularly interesting, in, and he's brought up all the time, by the way, and there's some good uh, trans English translations that you can get now and read there in various libraries, including, uh, I think we have one in ours. Um, and he's particularly interesting in that his arguments for an instantaneous creation rather than one in six days. Notice he's not arguing for long periods of time. He's actually arguing for boom, and it was done, and then God explained it in six days. Or it's not exactly clear how he manages to, to uh, let's just say I'm, I'm not convinced uh, of the logical basis of, how he, of his explanation. Um, but his arguments are three. One, the biblical argument was based on Ecclesiastes, or Sirach, 18.1, which is found in your Apocrypha, and reads, He that liveth forever hath created all things in general. That's the King James Version. Um, in Augustine's Latin Bible, the last word read simul from which we get the word simultaneously. This was a poor translation of the original Greek, which read koine, yeah, koine Greek, which is well translated by the King James Version in general, and by the way, recognized as such by the translator who had no particular reason to dis Augustine. Augustine's philosophical argument, this is number two, was that creation took, uh, that took time would not be perfect as it implied intermediate imperfect steps. You see, there would be a time when there would be plants but no animals and that's not perfect and God doesn't do things imp imperfectly and therefore God wouldn't do it that way. This is unworthy of a perfect God. Uh, at least from a Platonic point of view. And um, Augustine's scientific argument was that it made no sense for light to travel around the world before the sun was created. Now, Augustine recognized that the world was round. And not only did he recognize the world was round, but he recognized that everybody knew the world was round, which means that if you hear people talking about flat earth and Christians and all that, they're full of baloney. That was a myth uh, in the 19th century. But Augustine said, okay, you have this round world, and the sun goes around the world, you know. I mean, that's the, the worldview of that time, which made sense. That's what things look like. And um, the sun goes around the world, but light would have to go around the world for three days before the sun. And he says, why would God do that? Those arguments do not work today. The biblical argument on the basis of a poor translation of an apocryphal verse doesn't hold water. The philosophical necessity of an instantaneously perfect creation is by no means obvious unless you're a Platonist. And light no longer has to travel around the world for the first three days. All it has to do is be unidirectional. The earth turns. 
It is also interesting to note that Augustine made his mistake in interpretation, and everybody recognizes it as a mistake, on the basis of the philosophy and the science of the day. This might be a cautionary tale for our time. Thus, if the biblical account has any weight, it supports a six-day creation that occurred in the recent past. Now, theological considerations. Theologically, there appears to be no advantage to the idea that God took a long time to create life on Earth. But there are two theological considerations that appear to favor the recent creation of life over old divine creation, one of which appears to favor recent creation over old demonic creation as well. In addition, old demonic creation has its own theological difficulties, which we'll get into, one of which has been alluded to already. The first theological consideration is that, the death of, that of death before sin. Romans 5 clearly states that through one man's sin, death passed upon all, for all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. The difficulty with old divine creation is that if one accepts the standard geological interpretation of the fossil record, death, including predation and disease, occurred before any reasonable interpretation of the time of Adam. According to this model, death of hominids as well as other animals, occurred before Adam. One can claim that they were not truly human, but the biblical writers seem concerned about nature as well as about humankind. Romans 8, 19 through 23 indicates that not just humankind, but creation itself was involved in the fall, and it will be redeemed along with us. Uh, for those of you who have forgotten, Romans uh, 8, 19 through 23, uh, particularly verse uh, 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, e even we are waiting for adoption to it, the redemption of our body. So it appears that this isn't just a matter of us, it's a matter of creation as well. Um, Matthew. 10:29 through 31 talks about two sparrows sold for a farthing. Not one of them shall fall on the ground without your father. And notice that you are of more value than many sparrows, which says that sparrows may not be worth much, but they're not totally worthless. And if God notices something that is dying that is not totally worthless, then God must not like that. Um, and that the ideal is to not have sparrows die. And Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65, which uh, you may remember, the wolf uh, shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion, the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and so forth. Uh, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. At least seems to say no predation, and kind of gives the picture of no death. And in, a, in, in Isaiah 65, the same uh, sentiment is found. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65 seem to indicate that animal death will not be part of the new earth, raising the question of whether it was part of God's original creation. Demonic old creation does not share this problem to the same degree, and this is one of the reasons why some people like demonic creation is because you don't have to attribute all that bad stuff to God. Demonic old creation can blame pre-Adamic death on a sinner, namely Satan. Thus, human death could be the result of Adam's sin, and animal death could be the result of Satan's sin. Death before sin is a problem mainly to old divine creation. The second problem is that of natural evil, such things as earthquakes, floods, and tornadoes. The problems of human-caused evil is usually solved by postulating that God gave us free will, and since it is truly free, God is not responsible for our choices. We are. The risk of allowing people to choose wrongly is usually felt to be outweighed by the benefit of the possibility of true love, which requires freedom. 
But if we accept that defense, it only justifies God in the case of human-caused evil. That defense does not justify him in the case of natural evil, unless you can somehow say that natural evil is human-caused or perhaps demonic-caused. Death by volcanic eruption, tsunami, or flood does not seem to be as easy to explain on the basis of human decision, at least given an old divine creation model. And here, even an old demonic creation model might have trouble, although it try, would try to wiggle out of it by blaming the, the earthquakes on Satan as well. But a recent creation model can escape this criticism. For in this model, after the third day of creation, when the dry land appeared, major tectonic plate movement probably was absent until the flood, that should say the flood, and I'm, I have to look to see whether I caught that uh, before it went into print, or at least until the fall, implying no deaths caused by volcanoes, major earthquakes, or tsunamis. With a fairly uniform, mild, rainless climate, hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods wouldn't be non-existent as presumably would be droughts. And finally, such diseases as cancer would be absent according to Revelation 22.2, which uh, you may remember finishes up with, and the leaves of the tree, which is the tree of life, where the healing of the nations and the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, so uh, there was no need for uh, major diseases in, in the case of Adam and Eve. So most, if not all, natural e evil would also be the result of human sin, thus releasing God from direct responsibility for this evil also. Old demonic creation partially avoids these problems, maybe a little bit uncomfortable in some places, but yeah, mostly. But it has its own theological problems, for it comes very close to duplicating the old Gnostic idea, as you alluded to, that a lesser God created the material universe or at least the living creatures in our part of it. In fact, a demiurge who's kind of bad. There is also the problem of the relationship of the demonic creation to the divine creation. Did God recreate everything, including ginkgo trees, calicanths, and horseshoe crabs that are found in the fossil record and also today? In that case, why did he use the devil's models? Or are all animals that can be dated over, say, 50,000 years ago actually demonic creations and not very good, as Genesis 1 seems to imply? Perhaps more to the point, did some hominids survive after Adam and some humans have more or less demon-created blood in them? And Adam intermarried you know, Cain's wife and all that. Uh, what about Seth's wife? Uh, he didn't marry his sister either, did he? And, and, and uh, there was really a whole bunch of humans, well, humanoids, and uh, so this intermarriage thing, and so some of us have more or less of the demon-created blood in us. Um, maybe the darker races have more demon... <coughs> I'm not sure I want to go there. <coughs> Um, or did all the hominids besides humans get killed off, the humans that God created? In that case, why do we look so much like previous hominids? Now, <clears throat> this is not to say that some solutions cannot be found, but it does suggest that there is some strain in the theory, which is at present not relieved. The problem, of course, does not exist with either old divine creation, which attributes it to God, or recent creation, which also attributes it to God. So given the above options, theological considerations seem to be supportive of a recent creation. Now for the scientific considerations, we finally come to the, the strongest argument for an old creation, whether demonic or divine that there is, quote, overwhelming evidence, end quote, from science for long age. But we need to be careful here. We've already seen a theologically charged area where the scientific consensus has turned out to be wrong. Intelligent design theory. 
In recent years, the scientific consensus had been protected by occurrences such as the official retracting of a peer-reviewed paper, and the paper for what it's worth is uh, uh, Steve Meyer's paper, and the references are in the book, and um, I give a short synopsis of what happened there. And for those of you who uh, didn't read the whole thing or can't remember it or want it, um, this, of course, will be on the internet later, probably later today, so that you can uh, uh, you can pull it up and, and read it at your leisure, just you know, freeze frame it. Um, in, in recent years, the scientific consensus has been protected by occurrences such as this one we talked about, the official retracting of a peer-reviewed paper, the denial of employment and tenure for supporters of intelligent design, and the removal of teaching responsibilities from an uh, individual holding tenure who is a recognized world authority in his field, and that, of course, is Dean Kenyon. And I give a reference in the book to exactly where to get, find that. A philosophically and or theologically motivated resistance against the Big Bang Theory has also been initiated by atheists. And you know, some Christians um, short age for the universe and don't like the Big Bang Theory, and they're critical of it, but you may not know that there's people who are critical of it because it seems to imply a beginning to space and time. It seems to imply uh, a creator. And uh, so atheists are also not happy with it, uh, perhaps even less happy with it. Thus, if short-age creationists are suppressed when their creationist sympathies become well-known, and I give two examples, Forrest Mims, and uh, Robert Gentry. And uh, again, in the book, there's actual references to where you can read it. And most of this stuff is actually on the net. And where possible, I have included uh, uh, web references in the book. It is reasonable to suspect that the settled consensus on the age of life on Earth may also be driven by sociological considerations uh, rather than data. In addition, we must note that there are some contrary data that are rarely mentioned in the mainstream science journals and especially in the textbooks. Some examples are given below. Erosion rates are too rapid. Erosion rates, even the, under uniformitarian conditions, are fast enough to cause severe problems for the current standard geologic time scale. One can compensate for that with uplift, but this leaves unexplained the existence of Phanerozoic rock, fairly recent rock, on the top of such places as Mount Everest and the Alps. They should have all been eroded away. And uh, Ariel Roth has a good presentation on that. Uh, sedimentary gaps. There's widespread uh, existence of gaps of millions of years in the fossil record without uh, evidence of the expected erosion between the layers. And again, uh, Ariel Roth has a couple of references on that. Um, that's the paraconformities that you hear about now and then. Um, ev uh, evidence of soft sediments, polystrate fossils extending through several bedding planes indicate rapid burial activity. I'll have to say I didn't group these actually. I had them all in one paragraph and so they've separated it and put little headings. Um, Soft sediment deformation and various intrusions of layers of sediment into each other show that both or all sedimentary layers were soft at the same time. And there's a couple of references. Um, uh, Morris had the most succinct one I could find um, for some of them. Amino acid racemization. This one, I'll have to say, was mostly written by the editors. They took a sentence of mine and expanded it into this. Amino acids in living organisms are in chemical form known as the L form. Over time, L amino acids tend to change to a mixture of L and that should read D forms at a rate that is thought to be constant. Comparisons of rates, uh, well, it's not really thought to be constants. Uh, it's, um, constants are, um, well, let's just say that they're not constant. They're, they're constant if you hold temperature and a few other things uh, uh, pH and, and uh, hydration and so forth constant. Um, 
Comparisons of rates calculated from fossil materials shows a progressive decrease in amino acid racemization constant with time, which is essentially removed if a short time scale is assumed. And that last half of the last sentence is pretty much mine. And I guess uh, it's Robert H. Brown's article that I refer to, which again is on the net. Most of these things are. Fresh biological material. There are viable bacteria, supposedly millions of years old, and the, uh, I give the 250 million years, but there's also some 30 million and uh, 50 million in, in amber uh, that are kind of interesting. Um, and um, tissue in dinosaurs that was not expected based on their supposed age, and again, there's uh, Schweitzer. Uh, there's, um, genetic deterioration, there is the question of how species can persist for millions of years with the present mutation rate suggesting that a short time scale is mandated by the mere fact that life is present today. And the definitive argument on that, of course, is, Stanford, is Sanford. Um, anomalous radioisotope dates. Even in the field of radiometric dating, there's evidence from carbon-14 dating, which I give my uh, uh, article in Origins, and also um, Baumgartner, that should, I have two J's in there, and that's wrong. Uh, that argues th that the and beryllium 10, which I, uh, my book is probably the one place where you can find that, which is again available on the net for free. And um, uranium lead dating, which uh, Gentry's uh, 1976 science article is an excellent one in this regard, that argues that the current time scale may be incorrect. Uh, Radiometric dating is most often cited as proving a long time scale, but there are two possible explanations for radiometric dating that are consistent with a chart time scale. First, in some cases, the clock can be documented not to be reset to zero during geological events such as melting that have usually been assumed to reset, have reset it. Argon can be retained and isochron lines can be mimicked by mis mixing lines. Second, there is strongly suggestive evidence that accelerated radioactive decay has occurred in the past. And this may precisely mimic old age in most dating systems. And uh, my uh, book has a thorough discussion of the first one, and the second one is uh, D.R. Humphreys. And then uh, um, in the uh, rate book, of uh, Snelling and, and Baumgartner's uh, uh, reference are also there. There's even some reason to believe that both explanations are uh, important, and that's where they recognize that. Conclusion. The above conclu uh, considerations are not intended to be exhaustive or to imply that more work is not needed on the recent creation model. But they should suggest that such a model pr provides a good explanation for a considerable amount of scientific evidence that cannot be explained well by competing models. Given the strong biblical and theological support for a recent creation model, it seems reasonable to give this model serious consideration and in my opinion, it should be the favored model. But isn't short age creationism falsified by multiple lines of evidence? Of, of evidence? The question betrays a profound misunderstanding of how science works. Science is not in the business of falsifying theories. That early Popperian concept has itself been shown to be inaccurate. What might naively be thought of as falsification turns out to be viewed from inside a theoretical framework as anomalies. And it's really not a falsifier. Although anomalies do not help a theory, they rarely cause its overthrow. The theory is rather abandoned when it fails to produce new results or novel facts, as they are known in the philosophy of science. You can't do anything with the theory. That's when a theory fails. Short age creationism has produced just such novel facts. Supercontinental paleocurrents, I should have put in a reference to uh, uh, our Chadwick's work, uh, in carbon-14 in fossil carbon were suspected from a short age perspective and not from any long age perspective. They were in fact discovered by short age creationists. Some of the other scientific findings listed above, for example Mary Schweitzer's stuff, um, although discovered by adherence to long age, were not known until after short age theory was well developed and would still qualify as novel facts. 
It doesn't really matter who discovers them, although it's nice if your guys discover them. And that's not necessary. When one runs into an apparent falsification, it is appropriate to ask if that falsification will disappear after further research is done, which has happened, for example, with the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. Creationists need not quit when they find, when they face a difficult problem. And after that, there's a little blurb saying who I am and stuff, which I know won't bore you with. Um, and uh, let's see, I've zoomed past that. There. So, by the way, the the shot is uh, that's been in the background most of the time is a formation in astronomy that's known as the Eye of God, for somewhat understandable reasons. Um, Ariel Roth has a comment, and then there's I'm sure there's some other ones here. I just uh, first before too many of you leave. Uh, about the field trip on October 18 and 20. Uh, they've told you several places where together, let me remind you. We're leaving from Azure Hills Church at 8.30 on Tuesday, October 18. So go to Azure Hill Church. You can park your car there, leave it there for three days of the trip and uh, be no problems. Uh, Incidentally, uh, the bus is full. There's a waiting list for people still waiting to get on the bus and so on. So if you have not signed up, uh, maybe it's a little bit late. Which is the opposite problem we were having earlier, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for some reason, uh, everybody decided now to, to go on it. Uh, it's, we're going to the Grand Canyon, the western end of the Grand Canyon, which is extremely important in terms of the, how the Grand Canyon got cut. How did you cut, how do you cut a 200-mile uh, channel through the plateau of the Grand Canyon uh, without some catastrophic activities, what we're going to be discussing? And uh, you want a long lecture on that? <laughs> <laughs> I could uh, give it to you. <laughs> There's stuff there in the Western uh, Grand Canyon. He'll keep people spellbound for a couple of days on this subject. So, <laughs> uh, Just let me tell you, uh, one of the fascinating things about this is right there in Lake Mead area, you've got the Muddy Creek Formation. That's right in the middle of the channel of the Grand Canyon. Uh, there's no way that the Colorado River was there at the time that Muddy Creek was laid down because it's on both sides. And it's dated at uh, very recent. Uh, and that is considered the immovable object uh, that says, hey, that canyon has to be very young. So you're going to uh, see that. Yes. The um, uh, irresistible force is supposed to be the river. And this has affected uh, interpretation of the Grand Canyon uh, tremendously. Uh, maybe sometime we can talk about yeah. the Grand Canyon. Well, here. Uh, it, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, when you have a down. set of slides and maybe some pictures from the trip, I yeah. will invite you in, uh, yeah. to do that. Uh, but uh, the point I wanted to make, which is just a side track, point I wanted to make here is that we need to keep in mind the influence of dominant paradigms. And I know of probably no uh, case that I'm so familiar with as the fact that science in its secular approach has biased the scientific literature in a, such a severe way. You cannot mention God in your scientific textbooks or your scientific literature, or the way it's considered to be non-science. As such, science is a secular interpretation. It is not a search for truth that is open to all possibilities. You can do an awful lot of science without involving God question. Don't get me wrong. Science does a lot of things and it does a lot of marvelous things. When it comes to these basic questions, it is biased and it has closed its door to this possibility of God. You can imagine all kinds of things in science. You, 
talk about un other universes of which we have no evidence, fine. Don't you dare mention God. And because of this, the scientific literature is tremendously biased. Very few people don't realize the philosophical background to the bias in the scientific literature against creation. I just wanted to add that to the picture here. Good. Send the, the mic up. By the way, um, did I uh, address did I address your question adequately? It's not a question; it's just a remark. Yeah. No, I, I think that I think that it is true that that, that there's a uh, um, there's a problem with uh, with demonic creation, and it, it does just almost eerily reproduce the old Gnostic heresy that was uh, in the second century, and I think that that's uh, that's an important count against it. Uh, the other one is I can't I can't relate the old stuff to the new stuff. You know, does God use the devil's models? Well, if he doesn't, then are those the devil's models themselves? So, um, lions, sheep, whatever, are actually demon-created that the God decided to kind of incorporate into his new Adam. Maybe God only created Adam and Eve, and that was it. Go ahead. Uh, I'm a historian, but uh, what I find uh, particularly interesting is that uh, when this Gnostic idea appears, and I assume it is probably a couple of centuries before Christ in that period of time, or immediately at that time and eventually enters into Christianity, uh, that by attributing to the Murger or the demon and ident identifying the Murger with Jewish Yahweh, it inserts a certain notion that the God of the Old Testament and the God of Jews is different God than the God of Christians. In which case, what is this thing about the Messiah that's being expected? It kind of raises interesting questions about uh, what Christianity is all about. And we can connect it in a, in a direct way to the it is directly connected, or no, it is directly reflecting contempt and hatred of anything Jewish in that particular uh, worldview. That eventually it will, you can, you can link it with the origins of anti Semitism within the church that will let go for centuries and eventually show results uh, by in 19th and 20th century. Yes. Uh, I wonder if you are aware of what uh, Spectrum has done. It has re it's reporting that uh, the science teachers at La Sierra have uh, proposed to the church a solution to this problem. The solution is science deals with facts, religion deals with faith. Science de deals with evidence. Religion de deals with what you want to believe. Now, this is currently discussed in the Spectrum blog. And uh, I spent several hours trying to read everything and uh, made my comments. But uh, we need some heavy, f heavy, what, what you call? Hitters. Hitters, right. <laughs> People who, who can deal with this, it's a serious stuff. If the, ch and the, the church seems to be happy with this arrangement. Now, you mentioned. I don't think all of the church is happy with this arrangement. Well, and I, I know. include in some liberals. That, in fact, when I was sitting in church this morning, I had a, uh, a fairly well known liberal come over to me and say, he was just looking at my comments about La Sierra uh, on uh, one of our Sabbath schools earlier and saying that while he disagrees with uh, where I come down on it, he says the method I'm using is right on and he says that it's antithetical to what this particular statement is being made. Now, um, uh, 
there are conservative forces who want to read that kind of a statement as protecting their faith from a scientific challenge. I, I think that they don't understand what the, uh, what the other side wants, wants to do with that. And basically what they want to do is what the kind of what the Americans did to the Iraqis during the first Gulf War, which is to say rather than fighting the pillboxes, they just bulldoze sand over them and just keep on going and ignore them. Um, and I'm not comfortable with that because I think that there's only one reality and uh, eventually one side or the other is going to win or they're both going to partially lose or completely lose and that we will find an answer that is in fact the answer and th that it's not a uh, it's not a matter of you can just keep them apart because they're both making claims about the same historical data. Right. That truth is one. You cannot divide truth into two antagonistic claims. Either we, we descend from apes or we don't. We either were created by God or nature did it. This is a fight between glory given to nature and natural selection or glory given to God. Uh, re the book of Revelation, the last message to the world is give glory to God and not to nature. Now, you mentioned that, uh, uh, that those who dare to defend creation or anything intelligent in design or anything like that, they are removed from their positions. But we allow those who believe in nature, who defend nature and glorify nature, we are afraid to do anything with them or to offend them. I, I, do, I do respect some of the science teachers at La Sierra, and I'm a graduate from La Sierra. But I cannot agree with their position of defending nature and give glory to nature. This is something that has to be addressed, and we sit with, you are a champion. Ariel is a champion. But your voices need to be heard stronger every day. Well, that's part of why we have this class. Um, I have a comment here, and then Ariel Roth has another comment. Well, I just wanted to get back to the original subject. You talked about demon creation. In a nutshell, could you tell me what that is? Um, is uh, we, we as Adventists do believe that uh, there was an argument between God and Satan. Um, how that argument was expressed is is kind of um, could go a long ways on what what it could happen. Um, you asked why would if it was an argument, you asked why would he use species of the old creation versus having the new one? Right. If it looked if there was an argument, uh, I think God would be changing the subject if he changed those those um, things. Um, well, supposing, okay, uh, God, when God finishes the creation, and, and, and one of the things that a demonic creation is trying to do is actually allow for the historicity of Genesis 1. That, well, there is a six, that there is a six days uh, that we're may, perhaps misinterpreting somehow, but that humans were created in the image of God, and when God got done with the, his creation, he thought it was very good. And since he thought it, why, uh, I think one can take it as a, a given that in fact it was. Um, and so they're trying to take that kind of a picture 
and they're trying to interpret the fossil record. Some, I've seen some people that are trying to, for example, make God's creation into a, uh, the Garden of Eden proper, and that's all. That outside there was all this stuff out here. But when God got down, he did the six days and he did whatever he did to, to, to make the, the Garden of Eden. There's a whole bunch of loose ends that are hard to tie up on that, like did he actually make the sun just for this little place here and the sun wasn't around for the rest of the time? And so there are a whole bunch of kind of embarrassing questions you can ask about it. But the, you have to understand where the driving force is behind that. And the driving force is, number one, we can't deny the millions of years. Number two, uh, we want to uh, retain a belief in Genesis 1 as being a really inspired account, whatever that means. And uh, number three, we want to have something so we can have a fall. So those are the three, um, those are the three things that, that they're trying to fit together. I guess one of the things I'm saying is they don't really fit very well. But um, if, you know, with our church, you know, we do believe in a war in heaven. Actually, we occurred. do. And Ellen White, when you look at it uh, carefully, it happened before the earth was created. Much uh, farther. Yes. Because she even said that after yes. Satan was thrown to the earth, Yes. Then he, she, get, they got down to creating, going down to, to get into the business of creating the earth. Right. But that happened afterwards. Now it seems and, like and and the, that and the war argument will be that what happens is that uh, the devil is given 3.8 billion years, whatever the standard figure is. Well, I'm not. To, I'm not sure if that's to, the explanation. It, somehow or not. he got life from elsewhere. And then he was able to transmute that life into different kinds of bacteria. And then yeah, but I'm not going there yet. Okay. I'm, just, I'm just saying that the envelope is there. That the argument, the time for the argument has, there's nothing in the Bible that says how long it was. It happened before creation. And then when creation happened, it appears to me like it was an answer to those questions. And that when, when he created something, he called it good. It was good for a reason. It was good because it was an answer. If it was good just out of nowhere, well, then to me that doesn't make sense. So you have to have a work that is improving something in order to be good because you must have had bad before. Well, it's a, it's a reasonable argument. The, the problem that I have is very simple. Um, ginkgo trees, uh, for that matter, most, uh, most of the plant and animal life we have now can be found in the fossil record. In some cases, we can show that the DNA code is fairly similar. And in one particular case, we can show that the DNA code is 99% similar, uh, namely uh, halobacteria that have been found in the WIP project. Yeah. And so at that, and, and the interesting thing is that we don't have a lot of data. Most people aren't interested in testing this, and so there's been very little testing. But when there has been testing, those bacteria from back then actually do a better job. They have more enzymes. They can handle more situations than the ones we have now, which means that uh, you have to presume that when God created the ones we have now so that he made them very good and they're his answer to the devil, that it's actually a grade below what the devil made way back then. Well, and that gets, that gets me into territory that I really don't feel comfortable well, I, I with. I guess my point is that when you make an argument, and a person comes to answer the argument, he's going to use the subjects that the person that brought the arguments in the first place had used. Because there's no use to having an argument without that. 
And, and it would be nice if the bacteria we had now are better than the ones back then because then we could say, yes, God improved them. Well, I'm not, I'm not fitting it in like you're fitting it in right now, but I'm just making the point that if you had these arguments, which Ellen White in our church pretty much believes in, that, that when the answers to the arguments come, that he's going to use the subjects that the arguer came up with in the first place. That is true. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I want you to go beyond that simple statement and start projecting beyond and start making some scientific predictions I have. and see if they come I through. have, but it's way too much to talk about now. Okay. <laughs> anyway. uh, by the way, uh, before we move on, uh, I need to note that it's 11.30 and some of you have other places to be, so uh, 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 we'll continue on for uh, a few questions more. Um, I, just might mention, and then uh, I just might mention uh, in connection with your comments, uh, excuse me, get out of the way here. Uh, one of the uh, difficulties I have with that is that the Bible describes the earth as being without form and void and dark we, before creation we don't know week. what that means. And, uh, Scientifically, we know what that means, but all we of, don't know what it means. All of those are kind of against life on earth. Uh, if you're disorganized, if you're, if you're empty, if you're dark, and so on. Uh, we can't have life as we know it, uh, at least... Uh, in that in that context, uh, uh, per se, easily. But uh, I wanted to get back to uh, Nick's comments about uh, last year and so on. Uh, Paul and I have a lot of literature there. We refer to that, uh, I, I think, as uh, a discussion on this material. But uh, the the suggestion by the last year faculty. Of biology that they're going to recognize creation as a faith argument and they're going to do good science on the other side is no way to arrive at truth. You're putting creation in the less objective category and you're putting naturalistic science that excludes God as, as a more uh, elevated or... You've read the documents, and you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, let me state from an objective standpoint of biochemistry, statistics, probability, and so on. That uh, Take, for instance, the question of the origin of life, or the, question of the fossil record gaps, or the question of paraconformities, uh, and so on. To me, and I may be wrong, it takes an awful lot more faith to believe that the evolution model is correct than it does the creation model. If they are going to go down a faith route, let them use it fairly in science and in creation both. This idea of separating of a dualism and so on does not lead you to truth and as you mentioned there's only one truth it doesn't matter what route you follow uh there's only one truth and uh you're going to have to have a conclusion you're going to have to use faith in both but to me it takes a lot more faith to believe the evolution model uh comment over here well, the gentleman left, and my I wanted to address the issue, uh, but he raised the uh, he, his comments raised uh, an interesting question, and I observed in this debate, uh, John Walton was at Andrews University a few months ago, and uh, you're probably familiar with that whole deb whole debate, and I'm wondering, it's interesting that of all academics involved in this question. There is no historian. When Genesis was written, that account, it was written centuries and centuries after the fall of Adam and Eve. 
So when God, when the text says, and it was good, it was very good, the reflection was, the argument was, or a statement was for the people who lived at that time. That the comparison of good was That's with right. the fall, and not necessarily with what became that's came right. before. And, uh, and I, I, I wanted to answer to the gentleman's statement. But I also want to bring to the attention, we cannot read Genesis 1 alone. It, Genesis 1 alone does not make sense, does not answer existential questions to the people who received the revelation centuries later. Human beings want to find answers to the fundamental questions of life. Why evil? Why do I die? Why suffering? Where do I come from? What is the purpose of life? What's the meaning? Why am I here? Where do I go? And those are fundamental questions of life. Our origins of life is one of those. And Genesis 1, if it stands alone, God reveals himself, says, yeah, I created in six days. It was very good. And that's the end of the story. Doesn't answer much. You have to read it with Genesis 2 and 3. Because the question, Genesis 3 finally tells you, you know what, it was good when I created it. But the mess in which you live is caused by some other way, some other means. And so... <clears throat> That is where I find Walton's argument, one of, I mean, it just falls apart. You cannot read Genesis 1 alone. Genesis 3 also tells you it's the part of the same story. And uh, so we have to keep this historical context, when it was written, to whom it was written, what does it answer, and so on. And so, as Professor Roth already mentions, uh, the assumptions that human beings take in order to answer these fundamental questions are that's the level where faith comes in. You can say there is no God. And I can say there is God. Both of them are assumptions. Both of them have to be taken by faith. And so scientists, secular scientists, when they do science with the assumption that there is no God, that is based, that's faith. And then they can proceed from that point on and keep working, but they still operate on the assumption that there is no God. I agree. And Sue, so I think we have one here, and then we'll just keep playing antiphonally. I here. cannot then, compete with Dr. Boscovich. <laughs> uh, I have a, a, a question of chronology, and that's what you raised this morning. Um, we all attribute to Bishop Asher the chronology of creation at 4004 BC. I think at 10 o'clock in the morning, wasn't it? <laughs> Actually, I think that, that Lightfoot is the one that added the 10 o'clock in the morning in, in, in October 9 or some such thing. You did mention, though, in your earlier remarks, uh, the that, of course, this is based on the Masoretic text right. of Genesis. Actually, uh, that's not quite true. And, and I'll, the reason it's a, it's a minor point, but the 4004 was set to be four years, uh, 4,000 years before Jesus' birth. Uh, and uh, there were places in the chronology where you could go one way or the other, and so he kind of, uh, you know, went the way that was most uh, easily interpretable as fitting. My question is, is a little different, because you did mention the Septuagint, and uh, of course it provides a significantly longer history for planet Earth. It does. Yes, and I have friends who are pretty well read and uh, knowledgeable far more than I am of on the Old Testament text, who favor the Septuagint as a more reliable chronology. Now, I'm comfortable with that for one reason, it gives us substantially more time after the flood for all kinds of important events to take place, which must include an ice age, and it includes the development of, div of w sophisticated civilizations in Egypt, 
in China and other parts of, of the planet. So uh, I'm wondering if, if you would comment further on that. And lastly, there's an even larger stretch which was handed down to us in the Adventist commentary by Siegfried Horn. Siegfried Horn uh, pointed to the, so the alleged gaps in the genealogical record. And uh, he would go up happily up to a, a planet age of 10,000 years. Yeah. So this is coming back to the whole subject you were addressing this morning. Well, that's a long subject. And to do it justice would require at least another session. <laughs> um, the shorter answer is I find it easier to defend the Masoretic text for most of this than I do the Septuagint. Um, I won't right now go into the, the reasons for that. I, if the Septuagint dovetailed perfectly with ancient history and with um, and with uh, various kinds of dating methods and and with um, uh, apparent chronology and 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 uh, would allow one to to set a firm date. I could be persuaded that the Septuagint were the better numbers. I could be persuaded that they're both wrong and that we needed a little more time or a little less time or something like that. Um, I, I, I don't like to hold dogmatically to something when we don't have a final answer, and especially if there's something else that will give us a reasonable answer in between or in a slightly different direction. People, My, who, people who worked with Siegfried Horn, by the way, uh, have assured me that he was driven in his stretching of the time very largely by the recently disclosed dating from carbon-14, for which Horn had no answer whatsoever. He just felt obliged to use whatever arguments he could find to, to widen the, the time scale. And I, I think that there's very likely some truth in that. Um, now, of course, one of the things that I have done that Siegfried Horn didn't have access to is uh, doing the dating from the bones from Nineveh, which suggests that at at a particular point in the in the calibration curve, <coughs> the thing is off by 200 years. Uh, you know, at that point, you have to start asking questions about: Do we really know that much about carbon-14 dating, and do we need to re redo it based on more uh, firm <coughs> evidence? Oh, that's fine, but just but Siegfried Horn did not have this more that, recent that's right. understanding. That's right, and one of the reasons I'm reluctant to criticize people who do that is because sometimes they're doing the best they can with the evidence they have. As further evidence comes out, we find out that we didn't need all that much time. And if that happens, I am not going to say Siegfried Horn was a damnable person who led many people to the bowels of hell because of his, his heresy. I will say maybe he kept some people in the faith, uh, meaning Christianity in general. Um, hey, I'm not that, condemning that Horn, not in the that slightest. That wouldn't have made it otherwise. Man. So I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come around telling people that oh my, these people are, are, are bad people because they don't believe all of the truth. Um, you know, they believe as much truth as they have. Fine, that's fine for them. Then we see whether we can do better than that. And that's one of the things I'm working on. So I, I don't know if that answers that question or not. We, uh, yeah, and then, uh, uh, but we have, uh, come on down. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, it occurred to me that this business of creation by demons um, if 
that were true, then there is really nothing to stop them from doing any of their own creating after the second coming. So how would we consider them imprisoned uh, or chained during that time if they have their own creatures once again? Well, I think or, the theology goes like this. God stepped in and said, okay, it's my turn now. Let me show you how it's really done. And so then he creates a world that's perfect, and then the devil comes in and ruins it, at least for humans. Now, does he ruin it for the whole creation, or was the whole creation already half ruined? Or, you know, there's some unanswered questions there. But, but the, the, the theology, I think, wants to say what I said is a core thing. And then, uh, and then the theology goes, and then God demonstrated how good he was by doing the creation his way. And, uh, you know, the, the questions that I get uh, in trouble with is, how do you relate the demonic creations to the divine ones? Right. Did, did the devil know what God was going to do and try to get as close as he could? Um, it's not that it can't happen, it's just that it starts to stretch things. It was also an attempt to, it was also, uh, according to Gnostics, and built on Platonic assumption that matter is evil. So it is, it is an attempt to explain that everything of this world that is connected with matter is evil. Therefore, our souls go back to the world of idea, which is not. So that's also... Yes. Um, now, of course, some of these people would say very definitely that that's not true. When God created things that were very good, it means that at least this world can be a good place um, and that what we see is spoiled rather than, um, rather than evil pure. Because Gnostics would try to say, the mind is pure, the matter is evil. And I don't think that these guys would be caught in quite that trap that way. And that's why I hesitate to say they're just Gnostics, because it's not really true. But they do share some of the problems that Gnostics had. And uh, so I'm not completely comfortable saying, oh, no, you don't have to worry about that, because there are some things that are eerily similar. I agree. Uh, yes? Um, the uh, perhaps you've already addressed this, but uh, uh, from what you said and regarding the old demonic creation, uh, does what you say apply at all to new demonic creation or sort of modification of God's? Theologically, is, is there problems with that? Well, you see, once humans let the devil in, the devil can do whatever he wants to subject to the limitations God puts on him. That's human's fault for having sinned. You see, you, you still have the defense, if we hadn't done what we did, we wouldn't be in this mess. Uh, you know, if you hadn't stayed up and partied all night, you wouldn't be having trouble uh, with the test tomorrow. Because you would be rested, and you would have had taken that time to study instead. You can't blame the teacher for that one. That's your own fault. So just to clarify, your position is that the theological problems with the old demonic creation has no bearing on whether Satan was involved and his, his devils were involved in messing up things since the creation. That, I, I think that's correct. That uh, the, the old demonic creation is God letting the devil have the world even before humans fell. Uh, just basically giving him the world and say, okay, go for it. Uh, and then at the end saying, okay, now it's my turn. And then humans falling after that and saying, well, we like the devil stuff better than we like God's. And of course, they did it on the basis of, uh, as the joke says, the video. Um, so it wasn't really quite fair. But anyway. Okay, there is some uh, support for the idea that uh, uh, this the creation might ha might have happened even more than seven thousand years, because Josephus, he said he claimed that the Jewish race went back 
5,000 years at his time, in his time. Now, 5 plus 2 is 7. And then you have to allow for the time be between the flood and Abraham, which is where the Jewish race started. And then the time between creation and the flood. So you end up with at least 10,000 years or more. Now, I want to add something, something else in support of what uh, my friend uh, Ariel Roth said. There is no way for me to accept a church that says, that, that allows for a belief in common ancestry and common descent at the same time. If my ancestors were apes, then I have to admit that maybe some of the apes living today, their descendants, a thousand years or a million years from now, will be able to build skyscrapers, write poetry, and so on, which I cannot, I cannot believe. There's no way I cannot believe that. But on the other hand, if you were an evolutionist, you'd have to say it happened once, could happen again, why not? <laughs> well, anyway, that, that um, I guess concludes our discussion on a very, or at least our formal discussion, on a very, very fast run through time. <laughs> and like I say, when I was writing it, uh, I, I keenly felt the, uh, the, the limitations of the, time, of the space. Um, and uh, uh, as you can see, there's a lot that it could be expanded into if you, if you had the time and, and, and uh, space to do so. Anyway, next week... Um, if uh, nothing else shows up, we'll have uh, Dave Ekin's uh, chapter. We'll go through it. It's an interesting question about uh, science, miracles, and, uh, and, uh, and faith and how they relate to each other. And uh, uh, we'll go through it and try to make some sense out of the subject.